Well, hello, YTPC. This is Dave coming to you from the paddock here in Southern Maryland. <clears throat> it's just before noon again. Uh, now it's Thursday, February 15th. And you guys are gluttons for punishment. You've made it pretty clear you want to see a session too. So we're going to continue into this series. I believe we're looking at a five-part series at this point. Some of you asked me if I uh, ever have thought about doing life coaching or mentoring, and, and I do do that, and I consider what we're doing here kind of part of that. Um, and some of you said, I can't believe you're doing this for free, and I, and <clears throat> that is part of what I'm trying to do is give back because many times the people who the mo need this sort of thought process the most can't pay $10,000 for it. Uh, my business coach was thirty grand a year, and I went to him for three years. You kind of have to have your shit wired pretty tight to pay thirty grand for a counselor. Now that's high end counseling, and it served me well, but that's not what I'm trying to be right now. So we'll give the milk away for free for a while, and hopefully it helps. Even if it helps one person make a life transition, that's good enough for me. So um, that's kind of what's going on on this side of the camera. Uh, we'll head into uh, part two here in a minute. <clears throat> First, we got the Maryland Marisham looking good. What have I got in it? Same as yesterday, by the way. Brown bogey. Um, I love it. Once it gets about 20, 30% into the bowl, it really starts to catch fire, and it really becomes a beautiful, wonderful tasting smoke. And today, I've got a little bit more laid out. So I clipped off about 20 coins real thin, and broke them up and letting them dry. And then I'm like super light pack. I don't even, didn't even push it down today. Nice and light, lots of air. Hopefully that'll help it burn better. So I did a thing. Um, normally that means you're getting something, but today it was me. I did a thing and it, it arrived today. I got myself a Lee Van Cleef. I think, for me, Lee Van Cleef was one of the coolest actors I've ever seen. Just that quiet composure, that quiet confidence. <clears throat> and now that I'm getting a little bit older, I'm probably closer to his age. Um, but his role in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is one of the, my favorite roles in uh, movie dumb, particularly old Western movie dumb. So... I wanted to, I thought it was cool, and I've seen a couple of you with these, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and get me one of these. Probably shouldn't even let my Marilyn Marisham see him, right? But look, <laughs> the size difference on these guys is hilarious. I can't even do it right. But tiny little pipe, probably a good 15, 20 minute smoke, maybe, compared to a 30, 40, an hour in here. But anyway, I just want to show you, I did a thing, brought a new pipe. Why do I buy pipes? You've seen me smoke two pipes in the last year. This one and my Wyoming Marisham, but I keep buying pipes. It's like an addition. What do you guys call it? Pipe acquisition disorder pad? I have it for sure. Anyway, I love this thing. I love leaving a cleef. And um, I guess that's all I wanted to point out. I do a light tamp. It was fun to jump on that one last nerve of Greg's the other yesterday when this thing wouldn't light. Oh, there it is. Oh. It lit. It certainly lit easier than yesterday. And uh, by the way, if I haven't said it in a while, thank you, Greg. Right, so we're heading into session two. So you see, yesterday we talked about the dream and the readiness, the 
the environment in which we're surrounded. And today we got to think. So we're here. We're session two. We got to think. <clears throat> another another way to title these boxes, and I'll actually put that on these for tomorrow is. The dream box, the dream phase, the dream session has two purposes. It's to define your why. Why are you doing this? And then secondarily, what's the environment that surrounds your attempt? But the true reason is the why. What's your why for doing this reboot, this restart? Today, session two, the think session is really how I would title it, the what. What are you going to do as part of this restart? And then session three, the plan, is what I would call the how. Session four is act, which is the do. So you have the why, the what, the how, the do. And then you got to figure out if this shit's working, which is the reevaluate, which will be session five. So the the why, the what, the how, the do. Today we're going to talk about the what. How do you come up with what you're going to reboot to? Be visual people. That's how I would make it work. Why, what, how, do. All right, that's what we're trying to do. Today is the what. Well, this shouldn't surprise anybody, but <clears throat> session two, figuring out what you're going to do, what business are you going to create, what a revenue stream you're going to move to. This is going to be a series of questions I need to ask you to get you ready for the answer. And uh, remember, I'm not going to give you the answer. You have to figure it out. But we're going to ask some questions, and I'm going to put some jersey walls up around you, what I think... <clears throat> You know, kind of the playground you need to stay within to be successful, particularly if it's your first venture. If you've already got a income stream up and running that you intend to keep and, and you're just creating a second one for redundancy, that's a totally different world. That is not where we are in this series. This series is my life has crashed, is crashing, is going to crash, and I need to come up with a reboot. <clears throat> so... I'm going to put some jersey walls up on your thought process towards the end of the video to keep you from, hopefully, from driving off the cliff uh, or driving off the slopes of Mount Hope. All right, guys, what kind of business income stream enterprise are you going <clears> to <throat> create to become your stable income? Stop what you're doing. Look at the look at your screen and listen to me. The single most important question that you need to answer when even beginning this the journey towards an income stream. All right? I got your attention. You're looking at me, right? You're not eating dinner, your wife's not babbling in your ear, you're not petting the dog. <clears throat> Number 1 is when you look around your world, what problem exists, what hole exists that you intend to solve or fill? We're going to talk about other criteria, but man, this one is easily number one. <clears throat> you can't even see number two from here. If you want something to fire up quickly, profitably, and remain so, you've got to fix a problem. You've got to fill a need. You've got to fill a hole. So when you think of something, how do you know it's a problem or a hole? You want to test your theory that this is a problem. If it's your idea and it came from your head and your life experience and no one else's, you really need to test it. <clears throat> you know, what's something that people around you are looking for that they can't get? You know, are people saying to you, are you hearing people? Are they saying yes if you talk to them about 
know, this you just use a real example. I cannot find a decent roofer anywhere in this county or state. I can't find a lawn service to actually show up and do what I ask them to do. I cannot find a paving company that can do a decent job. I made all those up. What are you hearing? <clears throat> what are your kids telling you? What's your wife telling you? What are other family members telling you? Can you develop a consistent theme, a consistent story of this is definitely a hole that needs to be filled around here? Now, I'm giving you like super simple examples because I don't want to break your brain on big ones. I'm going to give you one out of my life. So I'm going to start with a headline. I discovered that there was no company very good at providing support services to the FBI. Yeah. As a true statement, I began to serve the FBI in April of 1995 as a one-man show. When I got inside the Hoover building, I mean, I was inside the Hoover building all day, every day, 10 hours a day, five, six days a week, working on task force, weekend forces, special tasks. They had me doing some crazy shit right away. And I realized those I was surrounded by sucked. Some of the individuals are great, but the companies they work for were more interested in profit and their other accounts. They had The Bureau had no... <clears throat> single source they could go to and say, can you give me these 10 or 20 um, talents? You know, they, um, or they'd get lied to. They had no trusted agent they could turn to. And so they were getting bamboozled by the larger companies too. Uh, I came in sort of on what they call the government side of most of these things. I was a contractor, but they used me to oversee other work. Because they were getting screwed, to be honest, by the Lockheed Martins and the Northrop Grumman's. And they needed someone to come in and help them. Because people who are trained to shoot people aren't very good at that. I always felt good. I always felt the FBI was great out in the field offices and kind of sucked at headquarters. And if, and if my FBI was going to suck somewhere, I wanted them to suck at headquarters because I could help them there. I couldn't. 56 field offices and 300 resident agents. I mean, I could not help them out there. So I felt good about where they sucked. But there's an example of walking around as a one man who saw this bewilderingly large problem. <clears throat> and it became pretty obvious I was possibly a solution for that. Now, it took me 20 years <laughs> to build the solution, eventually I sold it. So, you know, the bigger, more complex, the problem you see, the longer it's probably gonna take to solve it. But there's one example, walking around in my daily life, everybody was bitching and moaning about the quality support they were getting and the price they were paying for it. And so after a couple months or a year of that, I was like, holy shit, I think I, think I can pull this off. So there's one, example from my life that sure is if that was the only example i gave you i think it would break your brain you're like well how the hell am i supposed to do that you know so that i give it to you as a real life example that changed my life but there are much smaller simpler problems you are surrounded by 10 right now you just may not realize it all right the second family of questions that you need to ask so this is that distant second i told you about because now it's about you. And anytime we focus on you, you're way down the priority list. All right. So the first priority is out there <clears throat> the community, the world, the universe, the state, the county, the town, you know, wherever. You, you're, you need to focus on what they need, what they want, what they're looking for, what they think the problem is, what they think the hole is, what they're willing to pay for. All right. That's high priority number one. But now we're going to priority two, the second set of questions, the second family of questions you need to start asking about is about you. 
what are you good at? I'm not talking Olympic class or world class. I mean, that's what all the bullshit bumper stickers and pick me up seminars and rah rah is like, you, what are you world class at? Yeah, most of us aren't world class at anything in particular. And so it, it can demoralize the question process. If you go, what am I the best in the world at? I mean, it sounds so anticlimactic for me to say, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm best in the world at anything, but I'm pretty goddamn good at a bunch of things. So don't, <clears throat> don't, don't uh, overlook great because you're looking to be the best, the world-class guy. So just be aware of that. The question you need to focus on is what are you good at that will plug a hole people might be willing to pay for, okay? <clears throat> if you're great at movie quotes, like I am, nobody's going to pay for that, all right? So you got to be, you got to tailor this questioning process to the holes or the problems hopefully you've identified. What are you good at? What are you passionate about? You know, um, don't tell me Pokemon. Don't tell me movies. <clears throat> don't tell me baking. Um, I, and again, none of these are for me, right? I don't even want to know your answers. But the question is, what are you good at and what are you passionate about such that you're willing to work 20-hour days, seven-day weeks, 20 years to make this thing explode and be unbelievably successful? Maybe you're super good at handyman. Maybe you are great at fixing shit that other people aren't so good at. Maybe you're a wizard with your, you got a green thumb. And you're a wizard at making things grow in your weather environment, your zone, as they call it. Maybe you're unbelievably good at fixing cars or diesels, trailers. Maybe you're an unbelievable electrical worker. Maybe you got a skill, a hidden skill for plumbing. Um, maybe you're a great carpenter. I mean, I don't know, right? What skills do you possess? You have to figure that out. I wouldn't be too worried if it was a crowded field that where you're good at. Maybe you're a great car mechanic. You're like, well, there's 20 mechanics around. My, in my estimation, like around me, I could probably find 10 or 15 mechanics within 30 minutes of me. I know one great one. I know... <clears throat> 10 or 12 body shops around me. I know one, I would call it world class to be honest with you, but I know one spectacular body shop. Maybe it should be you. Maybe your area doesn't have that spectacular mechanic or that me the spectacular body man. And maybe that's you. So even though there's already 20, maybe there isn't a great one and you should become that great one. So just be careful. Don't put too many walls up around your thinking, around your brain, when you're trying to decide what it is 